How's it going everybody? It's Sam here and welcome back to the Morbid Vale. We hope you had a great Valentine's Day just as much as we did. Oh yes, it was quite enjoyable, wasn't it? Watching video games, playing porn. What the f- What the hell are you talking about, Jay? What? Isn't that what you did? No, of course not! That's gross! Oh, <laughs> guess it was just me. <laughs> Harley's been out of town for a few weeks, so I may have gotten a little lonely. For the love of God, Jake, get out! Oh, come on, Sammy boy. We're just talking about the birds and the bees. My hand and the... No, 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 no. I don't want to hear it. Out, out, out. Get the hell out. <laughs> I am so sorry for that. Well, we hope you enjoyed your Valentine's Day and that Jay didn't just completely ruin the holiday for you. If you haven't seen our previous video, click the pop-up now to view it. We've been working hard at getting these videos recorded and uploaded for you, and we appreciate your patience as we continue to work on making a set schedule for the channel. So without any further delays, let's jump into our first heroic build, the powerful Voice of Skyrim. story begins on the outskirts of Windhelm. Throughout his life, Michael Tollefson had been bombarded with hardship after hardship. His life never went anywhere except further into the empty void. His parents had died when he was 15, his fiancée left him for a merchant in Cyrodiil, and he had been homeless since bandits overtook his family home when he was just 16 years old. He yearned for a better purpose in life and pleaded with the divines day in and day out, praying for some sort of release from this continuous torment. He was 23 years old, living in the woods of Riften, off of nothing more than wild fish, berries, and the occasional rabbit he might catch in a snare, until that fateful day. While skinning a fresh-caught rabbit, Michael heard the sound of shouting, steel, and shields, and snuck over to see what was going on. And there, in the small clearing ahead of him, he witnessed the Stormcloaks and Imperials fighting against one another. He didn't know what to do. Should he go away? Should he assist one side or the other? Or was he safe just watching from behind this bush? As he pondered these thoughts, someone else decided his fate and knocked him in the back of the head with the edge of their shield, rendering him completely unconscious. Days later, when he finally awoke, Michael found that his hands were tied together, and that he was in a cart with three strangers. As he looked around, Michael saw an all too familiar face, Ulfric Stormcloak, the very Jarl who denied him aid after his home was taken by the bandits. But that didn't matter, not anymore, as Michael's attention was drawn to that wide axe and the hooded figure who held it, he knew that their journey had come to an end. The horse thief tried to run, but was killed by an archer, and though he was not on the list, the Imperial captain ordered that Michael would be executed with the rest. He couldn't believe what was going to happen, but at the same time, he accepted it. Believing that perhaps the gods weren't going to give him a grand life, but perhaps a magnificent place in paradise. As he knelt down, prepared to enter the next life, Michael saw a great beast approach from the heavens. He knew it by the stories his father had told him when he was a child that it was a real live dragon. After being knocked down by the powerful thume of the dragon, Michael began his escape, running as fast as he could. Despite having been sentenced to death by the Imperials, Michael recognized the sorrow and pity in Hadvar's voice and eyes as he obeyed his superior's orders to have him executed, and so he followed the Imperial soldier out of Helgen. 
Together they escaped to Riverwood, and eventually Michael found himself being sent by none other than Jarl Balgruf's court wizard on a special assignment. He was glad to be of some assistance, but was terrified of going through a dragon infested barrel. Nonetheless, Michael defeated the Draugr and obtained the Dragonstone that Farangar asked for. After returning to Dragon's Reach, a guard arrived, bringing news of a terrible dragon attack. Killing Draugr was one thing, but killing a dragon was a completely different situation. But Michael felt something inside of him, telling him that he needed to do this. And so he took up arms and followed the White Run guards to the watchtower as they confronted the mighty beast and eventually slew it. All were rejoicing as the beast fell, but soon shock and fear overtook them as something strange began to happen to the dragon's remains. A burning force lifted away from the dragon and flowed into Michael, and he felt the power rise up through him and found his new strength that he hadn't felt before. One of the guards told him that he was dragonborn and that he should report to the Jarl straight away. As Michael entered the city, a thundering roar came from atop the mountain, and upon speaking with Jarl Balgruf, discovered that the Greybeards were summoning him to their mountain. Without hesitation, Michael took his new housecarl, Lydia, and together they set out for High Rothgar. They fought their way up the mountain, and eventually came to the magnificent structure. After Master Angir told Michael everything he knew about the Dragonborns, Michael realized exactly what he was born to do. He was born with one purpose and one purpose only, to become the protector of the weak and defenseless, to bring a peace to Skyrim that had never been known before. Now let's talk about gameplay. Michael eventually takes up the name of The Voice, finding great power in his words, not only in the dragon tongue, but in the common tongue as well. He is a peaceful man, finding great enlightenment in the teachings of the Greybeards, and will choose to speak with others before resulting to violence. However, he recognizes that peace is not always an option, and thus he will fight to defend himself and others. To better protect everyone, he sets out to Winterhold, where he harnesses the power of Aetherius. He does not side with anyone during the Civil War, seeing great flaws on both sides. He also refuses to assist the Blades any further after they order him to kill Parthenax. Despite this, however, he keeps his guard up around the old Grey Dragon, as his name does translate to Ambitious Overlord Cruelty. He does make a pilgrimage to Parthenax and focuses upon the power of Fus, strengthening his thin further. He works hard to defend the weak, and does so with great efficiency. However, that does not mean he supports those who are cowardly, but may still help if they seem desperate enough. Though he does not care much for material items, he does recognize the importance of septums, and is not opposed to being awarded with them as they help him in obtaining food and powerful potions for his travels. The voice eventually gets attacked by strange cultists, and after learning as much as he can about his dragonborn abilities, heads to Solstheim to defeat the arrogant sorcerer known as Mirak. The voice views Mirak as an abomination, using his divine powers for evil rather than for good, or praising the gods. The journey is rough, but he inevitably destroys Mirak and frees the inhabitants of Solstheim from the dragon priest's grasp. Though he does not tolerate the cruelty of Grelod the Kind, the voice does not side with the Dark Brotherhood, and instead kills them all to protect Nern from their wickedness. Similarly, he joins the Companions and eventually becomes their Harbinger. But as soon as he can, he removes the curse of Hercene for himself and those who desire their freedom. Speaking of which, let's talk about religion. The voice worships all of the Divines, including Talos. Needless to say, he will save those who found more in prison for their beliefs. However, he does not respect all beliefs, as those who worship the Daedric Princes are appalling and cruel. As stated earlier, he will try to refrain from violence, but if the individual he encounters happens to kill others for their Daedric Masters, or Dark Pleasures, he will not hesitate to send them to oblivion. Speaking of facing the wicked degenerates of Skyrim, the voice uses a variety of abilities when combating his foes. At a distance, he bombards enemies with either fireballs or ice storms, depending on his enemy's weaknesses. 
and as they get closer, he will cast a rune, or a wall spell. Once they are within range, he will conjure a bound sword and begin hacking away at his enemies. Though he isn't as strong as most when it comes to wielding a sword, he can do considerable damage. When faced against the undead, he will summon the Guardian Circle to cut off a large group of enemies from the others, or from a powerful individual that he needs to focus on. He then uses spells such as Stendar's Aura to turn into a blazing ball of holy light. As suggested by his name, the voice does use his loom quite a bit in combat. From using unrelenting force to shout enemies apart, to calling down a storm from the heavens themselves. Amongst all of the shouts that he possesses, slow time is perhaps his favorite, especially when he's in close combat or has too many enemies to focus on at once. Now let's talk about the gear worn by the voice. Due to his slim physique, he prefers to wear a full set of light armor. He wears the Mask of Morakai for a couple reasons. The first is that the magical regeneration enchantment is of great help to him as he focuses primarily on casting spells rather than brute strength. The second reason is for the name itself, Morakai, which means glorious in the dragon tongue. The voice wears the mask to openly declare his dragonborn blood and to give glory unto the divines. Dragon's Roar is the name given to the unique set of glass armor worn by the voice. It grants the wearer greater control over the elements of destruction, as well as it taps into powerful restoration magic to heal the voice whenever he sustained an injury. The Battle Mage Bracers help the voice tap into a larger well of magicka and increase his efficiency in close combat. The Pilgrim's boots were designed for the very purpose their name hints at. With these boots, the voice is able to recover quickly while in combat allowing him to brutally attack those who harm the weak. Likewise, he's able to make his way to shrines much faster should he need the blessing of the divines. The voice wears an amulet of Talos as it allows him greater access to the powers of his thum. It's also a symbol of a former dragonborn watching over the last. RK's protection provides the voice with much needed assistance in combat. It allows the voice to use more potent restoration spells without draining all of his magicka. In addition, it also helps him regenerate lost magicka much more quickly, allowing him to continuously attack foes with powerful destruction or holy light spells. The voice carries two weapons with him at all times. The first is a simple fireball staff, which he has used to combat enemies before learning the fireball spell. Despite having acquired the knowledge of the spell, he does still use the staff in combat as he gained a good feel for it in his travels. The second weapon he carries is the Staff of Magnus. The reasons for carrying this weapon are quite simple. He saw the power Morakai possessed with the staff and knows that in the wrong hands, it can be a tool of incredibly dark power. He uses the staff to drain the powers from dark sorcerers while in combat, forcing them to encounter him in close range or flee making them easier to dispatch. While not a truly physical item, the voice does use a sword while in close combat. More specifically, he uses a bound sword, as it's weightless and very powerful if swung properly. Now let's talk about the perks that the voice has. The voice was forced from his home at a young age, and with continuous bad fortune, he isolated himself as much as possible, so much so that he eventually became invisible to those around him. He uses his skill and stealth to make his way past enemies, or to reach a vantage point to bombard them with potent destruction spells. With powers obtained through the Alteration School, and with the aid of the Atronach Stone, the voice is immune to practically all magical attacks, including the shouts of dragons. He uses these powers to great effectiveness, allowing him to continuously attack powerful magic users without depleting his own magicka. While not a master of conjuration per se, the voice has mastered the skills associated with bound weapons and chooses to use a bound sword in close combat. Likewise, he has honed some one-handed skills with his sword. Despite this, he prefers to use his voice as a first resort. Should peace fail, he is prepared for any battle, no matter how brutal. Now let's talk about some of the powers that the voice possesses. The voice has many ways to deal with his enemies, from simple killers to devastating hordes of undead, and everything in between. Akatosh's Embrace is a power combination that is effective against any foe, be they dragon or bandit. After taking on Dragon Aspect, summoning Lightning Cloak, and slowing time, 
the voice attacks his foes with fireballs, fire breath, and his bound sword, sending them to wherever the gods have fated them to go. Stendar's judgment is used against the undead hordes of the night. It's enacted by the voice summoning Stendar's aura and attacking enemies with wall of flames, fire breath, and his bound sword. It's quite simple, but very effective. Dragon's Roar is perhaps the most devastating power that the voice uses, and only against the most powerful of foes. The voice of Skyrim will call forth his dragon aspect, then call down a mighty storm, followed by a barrage of ice storms and fireball spells, and finally ended with such a potent unrelenting foreshout that his enemy is turned to ash. However, if he's going up against a dragon, any shout will do but he prefers the fire breath shout as a final attack. That's the end of our video. We hope you enjoyed our first heroic build, The Voice of Skyrim, and that we've given you a new and unique playstyle to try out. If you haven't already, click the like button, subscribe, and click the bell icon to be notified of our next video. Have a great rest of your week, and we'll see you all here next time on The Morbid Veil. Vale.